And uh, now we will have uh, Matthias Biel uh, from Software AG who will uh, present uh, to us like the API strategy for banks and fintechs in an open banking world. Matthias Biel, API strategist at Software AG. Hello, Matthias. How are you? Hi, Midi. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, thank you. The stage is yours for 20 minutes. Your slides are full screen and great. Excellent. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthias. I'm going to talk about API strategies for banks and fintechs. And to get started, I want to ask, well, how did we get here? Um, and I'm going to look at first the past, the present, and the future of banking products in order to understand what kind of strategies we should apply. So let's first look at the past. What happened with banking products in the past? Well, in the past, we actually had banking as we know it, where we did some bundling of um, separate banking products into a big mass market banking product. What we experience at the present with open banking and open finance is actually an unbundling of this mass market banking offer that's huge and spans a lot of different banking products. And when we look into the future at what's next in open banking, then um, we're going to see an unbundling again uh, or a rebundling, right? So what has been the output of the unbundling, the small pieces are going to be reassembled in new ways. They're going to be rebundled um, in banking as a service. So if we look at this step by step, well, in the past we had um, a focus on efficiency and on creating a mass market in banking products. We had all of these different um, banking products, for example, a current account, a credit card, trading account, saving account, mortgages, a retirement account. And all of these have been bundled together, all of these banking products into a big mass market banking product. So if you have your mortgage at a bank, it's very likely that you also have other banking products at exactly this bank, a current account or your credit card. And that's a result of this mass market banking offer strategy that we had in the past. Now, with open banking and open finance, we start with this mass market banking offer that we have created. But what we do now is we do this unbundling. And unbundling means actually that we take um, this big offer and we um, create separate um, separate products for it. And of course, these products are technology products now, um, and they are represented in the form of an API. So we have, for example, a credit card API, a current account API, a savings account API. And this is what we typically call open banking. Like that's the scope of PSD2 or similar regulations. And then um, we also have um, other APIs that are emerging in this in this area. For example, APIs for retirement accounts, for trading accounts, mortgages and loans. And this bigger scope is then what we call open finance. But it all moves in the same direction. It's an unbundling of this big mass market banking offer, making it available in the form of APIs that can be embedded. Now, if we look in the future, we're going to start at exactly that step that uh, was the output of open banking, so to say, where we had APIs in all of these different um, subcategories of banking. Um, and these are the APIs of the financial services industry. But a similar kind of movement is also happening in other industries. So we will see um, we will see that APIs are also emerging, for example, in logistics, in insurance, in accounting, business management, communications, transportation. So a lot of different APIs are evolving, and they're all contributing, so to say, to a Lego box that we can start building stuff from. And this Lego box contains, besides financial industry APIs, other APIs of other industries that can be rebundled. And we will now get a new kind of bundle. But um, in contrast to what we had in the past, this bundle is not a purely financial services bundle, but it contains all these other aspects of other industries as well. For example, we are becoming, uh, we get something um, that's a combination of financial services industry and logistics or financial services industry and insurance or financial services industry and transportation and so on and so forth. So all of this together 
is going to create very specialized banking offers. And those specialized banking offers are very personalized, very attractive um, for a very small niche market of, um, of end users that are going to experience them. For example, here is Judy. Judy is a musician. And as a musician, she now has a banking app that's specially, especially created for musicians. Um, so it contains a lot of the features that you have in all kinds of banking apps, like you have your account, you have your credit cards, but it also takes care of the income streams that musicians typically have, where they get their income from those streaming services like Spotify or, or others. So this is what um, what uh, can be the output of of such um, banking as a service offers, and there's a lot of different niches. For example, here is Mike. Mike um, is in a completely different niche. He is a frequent traveler. He's a businessman. Um, he doesn't have a lot of time. Uh, he's traveling a lot, and in between flights, he um, wants to take care of his finances. Um, so in this little time that he has, he wants to maximize what he can do. Uh, and when he has a lot of different bank accounts from different banks, he doesn't want to log in to all of these different banks, but he gets, of course, a multi-banking app where he can see all of these different um, banking transactions that are happening in one place. And um, that allows him to be efficient. And that's um, not necessarily something that is provided by a bank. But here in this example, this is something that's provided by an airline for their frequent travelers who have exactly that kind of um, challenge. Now, if you look at um, this new market that is created, then you can see that there are still mass market offers represented by those two black box. And um, besides those uh, mass market offers, we will see a lot of different, such very specialized, niche targeted um, banking offers. Right? And they are a composition of different APIs um, for very specific types of customers. And there's a lot of them. Right? Uh, that's why we call this distribution actually the long tail distribution in comparison to the mass markets, um, which, which kind of are um, only very narrow, have a few offers, but very popular ones. In niche markets, you have a lot of different offers, which are each by themselves, not very popular, but taken together, they can be uh, a very attractive market as well. So are niches profitable for banks? Is this a good strategy to um, go for one of those niches for a bank? For example, uh, let's take this here all the way on the right. So if a bank would try to cover this niche here, would that be a good strategy? Well, the answer is of course no, right? Because um, there's only uh, so few people in this specific niche um, that it would not be very attractive to focus on that. But using API technology, there is a better way of addressing um, these niche markets and addressing those niche markets at scale and in a very efficient way, right? So what you do in order to address this long tail market that is created or about to be created as a bank is of course that you use partners or developers. And each of these developers is focused on a specific such niche and maybe already has a customer base in that area. You can see the airline which has frequent travelers in this base uh, and, and, and so forth. So um, as a bank, you leverage these existing customer basis that partners are already having. And as a bank, you bring out these APIs um, and you put them on a portal, you have a partnering process, and then at scale and very efficiently, you can address this mass market. And now um, you don't need to go into each of those um, mass markets yourself, but you do that together with a partner. Now, what you can see here in this uh, slide as well is that developers are super important. Developers are now customers, right? And this is something that's maybe new um, because typically you think of as a bank customer, someone who has a credit card or a current account of you, but now the developer is actually becoming a customer. Um, but actually we shouldn't stop here, right? This is um, this is too, too short because they are very 
especially powerful customer even. So I would even say that developers are super customers because those super customers, those developers are bringing in a lot of end users. Um, like each one is bringing in a lot of these end users. Uh, and, and that's um, what gives them these superpowers uh, and this multiplier effect that those developers are having. Now I want to look at this from another perspective and I want to look at it from the perspective of a value chain. And if you think about the typical value chain that a bank has, then it starts with the bank having some data at the bank, uh, which is exposed via the bank's own app to an end user. Right? There's no developer in here, of course. Uh, this is the classical traditional model. Uh, value flows from the bank to the end user directly via the bank's app. And then there is, of course, possibility to compensate for, uh, for, for this value that the end user receives in form of fees by, uh, by the bank. Now, open banking and also banking as a service uh, opens up this value chain. And there are several places where you can actually open up this value chain as a bank, right? You can move it, uh, you can open it up on the left side of the bank, or you can move it up on the right side of the bank. And what we typically think of in open banking is that we open up the value chain on the left side of the bank, uh, meaning that we remove for this, uh, for this argument, the bank's app and move the end user over here. And then the bank becomes the API provider. Instead of providing the app themselves, they provide APIs. I have painted them here as a building block so they can be integrated. And the integration is happening not by the bank, but by those developers, by those fintechs and API consumers who are taking this building block together with a lot of other building blocks, some of which they might provide themselves and some of which they get from other places and other sources. And then they build an app out of this that will be presented to the end user like Judy or like Mike that we have seen before. Value flows here still from the bank to the fintech who gets some value from integrating this and to the end user eventually. And the end user then for this received value will have the possibility to compensate the FinTech and potentially the bank as API provider. Now the value chain moved left, right? And for a bank, that means they need to be really good at exposing APIs, securing APIs, marketing those APIs and partnering with interesting FinTechs. Now I said, earlier that the value chain can also be opened up on the other side. So what does that actually mean? That means that the bank now doesn't have the business assets itself anymore. We move them over there and the bank now becomes not the API provider, but the API consumer. The, a the bank will use APIs, which are provided by someone else, let's say a FinTech or another bank. And this other player is the owner of the business assets. Okay, so this is sometimes um, a little bit forgotten in this um, open banking, banking as a service world, that we have this second way of opening up the value chain. Value flows now from the fintech to the bank, to the end user, and compensation is the other way around. Value chain is now moving to the right. And that means that banks need to be really good at consuming APIs, orchestrating them, integrating them, and still building partnership. Now let's switch gears a little bit and look at the technology stack and how open banking uh, and, and all the other movements like banking as a service are changing the banking stack. And I have a very simple banking stack here for you. On this banking stack, we have on top the customer, we have a channel, to the customer, and we have a banking product as the basis of it. Now, typically in the traditional banking stack, we have a channel and a product all bundled together as one big block, right? This is inside the bank. The bank owns the channel, the bank owns the product. And with this bundle, we go to the customer. Now, if we introduce internal APIs, what's gonna change? If we introduce internal API, we basically have a zipper uh, in between the product and the channel, but this zipper is closed. This zipper 
um, means that now we have an internal maybe cleanup process or renovating um, process for our architecture, but it's not available to the outside. The product and the channel, even though they are um, potentially separable by this zipper, they are in fact not really separate. They are still held together and uh, inside the bank, we still have both channel and product. Now, if we introduce open banking, then basically we open up the banking stack a little bit, right? So the zipper is opened up, but not all the way, just a little bit, because still in order to open the banking product, in order to open our bank account, um, we need to go via the bank's channel. So it's not a complete product that has a, uh, where the life cycle of this banking product is covered completely by, um, is completely covered as a separate product. Now, if we introduce banking as a service, we have a complete separation between channel and product. This is the new reality. And we've seen a couple uh, of examples throughout the day. Now, this is happening also in other, other industries, right? So um, for example, uh, in, in uh, telecommunication industry, we also have this uh, separation between channel and product. We have now providers that only have the product, for example, Twilio. And we see this in a lot of other industries as well. So that means this kind of pattern as a service pattern is happening all over the place in other industries, not only in banking. And that leads us to this really big um, Lego box of building blocks that we can now assemble um, products from really quickly. And here I have a quote from the CEO of Lego, who says when he explains Lego, and I think it equally applies to the as a service world, that now we have this system where you can be endlessly creative in by putting those Lego blocks together in new combinations. Right. So what are the strategies for banks in those in this open banking environment? I have um, on the x-axis here, the ownership of the customer relationship. Uh, is the ownership internal or external? And the origination of the banking product. Is the banking product now something that the bank provides internally itself, or is it provided externally by someone else? Um, and in the middle, we have kind of a mix. Uh, something is internal, something is external. And then we get this three by two matrix where we can look at strategies for each of those. The traditional bank has everything internal, right? So the customer relationship is internal and the banking product is internal. With banking as a service, we basically play um, and exchange now the channel. So the channel is now not owned by the bank anymore. The channel is now owned by someone else and uh, the bank provides only the banking product is only an API provider. What I also see is that we have now a strategy for plug and play banking where a bank still owns the channel, but in addition, it sources banking products not only from itself, but also from external sources, other banks or other fintech players. And then we have banking as a platform where the bank is basically a broker and it has both a channel that it owns to the customer and it sources its products from different sources. And in addition, it provides its, um, its, its products also via the channels of a partner. And then we have a strategy that's only interesting for fintechs that are not banks at all. And these are the consumers of banking as a service. Of course, banks can be consumers of banking as a service, but equally um, non-banks can do that as well. And then we have a pure marketplace and a pure marketplace means they don't have the product, they don't have the channel, they are just a broker of banking as a service products in the middle. So those top two um, strategies are actually for non-banks that look like banks as a result of using those banking as a service uh, offers. And the, the bottom four strategies are actually strategies that can be applied by banks. Yes, and with that, uh, I, I'm at the end of my presentation. Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, scan the QR code and connect to me on LinkedIn. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Matthias. One, one quick question about the, uh, uh, do you address all these strategies with the same e API strategy or do you have to do differences into how you run your API program? What would be the main differences for all the one you strategy you shared? Well, I think, um, of course, the big difference is, are you an API consumer or are you an API provider? You need completely different technologies for those. And also, how much of the um, banking product lifecycle are you covering? Um, and I think um, that's the main difference between having a banking as a service strategy or having an open banking strategy. Yeah, so do you need at some point any shift uh, into how you govern APIs when you are f on one side or, or the other? Or can you, are you able to, uh, to manage the, um, them all with the same uh, governance model? Well, the governance model is probably partly given by your internal rules that you set for yourself as a bank. And partly it's also given you know, by the regulation from the outside, you get different kind of rules that you need to, to you need to follow. And um, there are, of course, differences between being a banking as a service provider and, and being a uh, being an open banking provider, a different set of rules that apply to you. Yeah, uh, last question. Uh, do you need also to adapt KPIs for APIs for each of these strategies or not? Yes, of course. Um, KPIs are are very good um, to have. Um, I think, um, well, I think, um, of course, when you have internal APIs with the traditional model, you would have completely other KPIs focused mainly on, you know, the, the, the efficiency of the new architecture that you're, you're setting up. And uh, when you go external, you are looking more at business metrics uh, for your API. Uh, so I think this is this is the biggest uh, shift that you have uh, to go through when you um, when when you kind of externalize your APIs. Uh, and I think um, I think that's that's uh, really a tough challenge to have um, business. KPIs on your APIs. They're really valuable to the business, understandable by the business, and um, and actually uh, say something about um, about the business value that your API provides. Perfect. Thank you very much, Matthias, for an answering these questions. Uh, and again, if you want to reach Matthias, you can go, uh, you can reach him directly on social networks or uh, LinkedIn or uh, API University that he also runs. Thank you very much, Matthias.